John chapter 3, we'll begin to read at verse 14. John chapter 3, verse 14, and we're going to try to set the context. He said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if you mark in your Bible, underline eternal life. Look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mark in your Bible everlasting life. Now look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they're wrought in God. Father, would you help us tonight? Would you open the book to us? Would you make it plain and understandable? And God, we need something, God. We've got to get something from you. Because, God, we've got to face the world and the flesh and the devil. Many going back to work tomorrow, homes that need help. God, just in our lives, in the persecution that comes to us, Lord, help us to recognize the glory, we pray. But, oh God, would you help us tonight? In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, save that person here that's lost. We ask you for that. And Lord, we're not trying to be oppressive. But, Lord, we know we found a day when the glory descended and our sins went under the blood. And it's been good, and we want that for everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. These, there are great Bible texts, and this is one of those great Bible texts. One of the problems that I have with a lot of preaching, and I l try to listen to a lot, and, and is this. It's what I call scripture plucking. In other words, we take, say, John 3.16, and we pull it out, and we deal with something that's really not there, but we can assign it to it. And so we, and, and by the way, the charismatics are terrible about this. And uh, so we just decide we're going to do a sermon on that. Now, listen, your preacher, if he's got any preach in him at all, every once in a while, he's just going to deal with a subject. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. But there's something about exposition of Scripture. And the one thing you've got to deal with when you deal with exposition of Scripture is you're going to have to deal with context. Now, what's context? Let me see if I can illustrate it. I had a, I had a young lady and a young man in church, and she was poor, and he was poor. I mean, they just... And they fell in love and decided to get married. And I said to them, y'all going to starve to death. You understand that? <laughs> and she said, we can live on love. And I said, I'm telling you, <laughs> love's real good, but uh, when it comes to putting it on the table and eating it, it's a little, hello, it's a little difficult. Amen. Well, one Sunday morning, I was at the church, and she came in, and she walked in, and, and she said, Hey, Brother Bob, how you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. And I said, great. And I just turned and went back to what I was doing. And, and uh, she said, Brother Bob. And I said, yeah. She said, you notice anything different? And I said, well, you're looking good this morning. Amen. <laughs> you like to play with folks too, don't you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and uh, she said, Brother Bob. The ring, the ring. I said, oh, you got a ring. She said, it's an engagement ring. It's a diamond. And you remember what I just told you? They were poor, and he was poor. And I said, well, amen. And so I, she said, look at it. And she held it out there. And I'm telling you, the jeweler had been real nice to him. He had. There was somewhere in the middle of that a diamond. 
Hello. But what he'd done is he'd cut the facets to where, uh, in, in the ring to where that if you held it under the light, the light reflected onto the diamond and made the diamond look a lot bigger. Amen. Context is the facets that make the diamond look bigger. So there's always a subject, and you're looking at that subject. Now, one of the problems that you've got with John chapter 3, verse 15, and John chapter 3, verse 16, is the problem of context. Matter of fact, if you look at a book and it has contradictions in the Bible, it will tell you that one of the contradictions in the Bible is John 3, 15 and John 3, 16. Number one, because in John 3, 15, it says eternal life. In John 3, 16, it says everlasting life. And what they say is this. The Lord said to Nicodemus, everything that's in verses uh, 3 through, uh, through verse uh, 15, and then later on, John or somebody else added verses 16 through 21. That Jesus didn't really say those verses. Well, folks, I, I'm supposed to be smart, but I, I don't think I'm quite that dumb. Hello? You say, what do you mean? I know Jesus wrote it. Jesus said it. Excuse me. Well, how do you know? It's in red in your Bible. Hello? But you do have a problem with John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, because in a very real sense, the context changes. Now, don't miss this. What's the context of John chapter 3, verse 16 through John 3, verse 21? Well, it's real simple. We we'll understand context in several different ways. Number one, the subject changes. Number two, there's a word that's used over and over and over in those verses. Look at John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not his son in the world to what? Y'all got to help me. It's going to be a long night. You're not going to get much sleep. <sighs> For John sent not his son in the world to what? Ah. Uh. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not, but he that believeth not is. Oh, verse 19. And this is the? Wow. So we've got a word that's used over and over and over and over. And it's the word condemnation. Did Jesus say it? I certainly did. Now, understand something. When the Holy Ghost of God comes to you to get you saved, He begins to deal with you about several things. John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. Number one, He deals with you with the fact that you're a lost sinner. Number two, He deals with you with the truth that Jesus is your only hope. And number three, He deals with condemnation. He deals with the fact if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Amen. I gave my testimony one time, and I, I said the reason I, one of the reasons, the main reason I got saved, because I just didn't want to go to hell. And I had a preacher come up, a preacher come up afterwards and say, "Well, that's not very spiritual." And I said, "May not be very spiritual, but I'm not going." Hello. So why does God double things like verse 15 and verse 16? Number one, he does it for, in, for emphasis. Remember the Lord said, verily, verily. Now you're talking about God in the flesh. And when he says verily, truth, of a truth, that's all he's got to say. But he says verily, verily, you better perk up and listen. Amen. And so he is emphasizing also, the Bible doubles to get your attention. It's time to listen. In the Old Testament, the Bible doubles for poetry. I know, we think it's got a rhyme to be poetic, but it, you know, Old Testament poetry is not the same as what we do. Now, 
The fourth reason is a change of context. And it's to make sure we understand that. Now, I love John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. You know why? In John chapter 3, you got somebody who's too good to get saved. In John chapter 4, you got somebody who's too bad, who's too bad to get saved. Hello. <laughs> We're living in a time when everybody's too good to get saved. My pastor told a lady, she said, well, well I, I, I believe I'm lost. And he said, you know what your problem is? You're just too good to get saved. You think too highly of yourself. Oh, yeah, that's got to come a point someplace where we just say, yes, God, I'm just as wicked and ungodly and filthy and as you say I am. Now, I, I want to look specifically at tonight at John 3, verses 16 through 21, okay? It's not going to take us long if you'll help me. Amen? Okay. Number one, look at the manner of God's love. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. What does it mean that God so loved the world? And I've been guilty of it. I mean, we just say, well, God loved the world. We talk about the majesty of God's love, the beauty of God's love. Uh, we talk about the magnitude of God's love. How do, you, how do you even understand, start to comprehend the magnitude of God's love? Right. Right. Folks, I can't even understand why God loved me. Yeah. Right. Right. Amen? I know me. Yeah. No, don't go ask my wife anything after the service. Amen. Hello? But God knowing us, knowing us better than we know ourselves, still loved us. Now look at this. We can talk about the magnificence, the grandeur of the love of God, but that's not what it's saying. He said, for God so loved the world. That little word so is an interesting word. See, we, we have a bad habit of glossing over the little words and running to the big important words. The little word so means after this manner, after this fashion. Hmm. My daddy used to, he was a, uh, my daddy was a soul winning Baptist deacon over 60 years. Lived to be 90 years old, still trying to lead folks to Jesus. Hello. But he was also a disciplinarian, and being a disciplinarian didn't just mean that he corrected me, it means he taught me. And so what he would do is he'd say this. Now, son, here's what I want you to do. Number one, do this. Number two, do this. Number three, do this. Number four, do this. Do it in that manner. Don't change it. Don't think about it. Always remember, he said one time, he said, you know, it really, it really would be much easier for me to do it myself than to get you to do it, but you never learn anything. What is the manner of God's love? He said, just in this way, God loves. Now listen, I, I have a lot of problem with theologians. I don't mean to be ugly. Uh, I just do. Number one, I've been teaching theology too many years. And, and one of the things that theolog theologians try to do is they try to explain God. Now, if you read a book of theology, it starts out with the attributes of God. When I wrote a book of theology, I started with the gospel. Why? Because if you really want to know God, go to the gospel. In this manner... God loves the world. I was going to Jackson one day. Somebody put up a billboard. And it was Jesus on the cross. And it had underneath it, this is how much I love you. I just struck me. I, 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 can't, I can't kick up and shout and run around the car. I'm driving in traffic, amen. And so, boy, I just had me a good time about a mile. 
And then I realize you take one word out of that sentence and it's still true. This is how much I loved you. No, this is how I loved you. You know how God loves the lost person? He loves them by the cross. <clears throat> by the way, I was listening to a fellow in Houston, Texas, preached to about 30,000. Well, he called it preaching to about 30,000 people. And, and he was talking about, you're God's special child. Now, he didn't do anything with salvation, you know. It, you know but you're just God's special child. God just loves you. Well, let me ask you something, Christian. How does God love you? He loves you in Christ. Amen. You see, He loves His Son, and we've been placed in Christ. And He loves us in Christ. In salvation. Hmm. Somebody said one time, would you explain to me the love of God? And I said, I'll be glad to. And they said, really? I said, yeah. You can explain the love of God. I said, when we get to heaven, I'll try. I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. We'll even be able to explain it there. Now, folks, that's the manner of God's love. I'm talking about the cross. If you want to see the expression of the love of God, that's it. May I say something to you? If you're here tonight and you're lost, God's done everything possible He can do to get you saved. See, I keep meeting people, and what they want is they want salvation in their sins. They want God to do something special for them. They want God to excuse their sin. Now, folks, God's never excused sin. He don't even, <laughs> if you hadn't figured it out yet, He don't even excuse sin in His children. Right. Ooh, <laughs> fellow said one time, said, well, I know what the Bible says, but I'm going to do it anyway. I said, just have fun. Just enjoy yourself. Hello? Well, amen. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I, when God gets finished with the woodshed, you in the woodshed, I'm telling you, hello. God doesn't even excuse sin in us. Now stay here. That's the manner of God's love. It's the cross. Number two, the message of God's love. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Wow. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's the message. The gospel is found, Paul said in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. By the way, there are two sections to the gospel. I, if you look at the context, they are separated according, by this little phrase, according to these scriptures. He says, first of all, in the first place, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Folks, that's the good news. Man, that's good news. <laughs> hallelujah. Amen, brother. I'm telling you, whoo, glory, hallelujah. Now, you know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say... How that Christ died for your sins, you old dirty, rotten, filthy, ungodly, wicked. Says he died for our sins. I just wicked as you were. You just wicked as I was. And we just wicked as all this bunch is, and they just wicked as we are. And he died for all of them. I love whosoever will. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You know the worst form of racism in America today? Oh, y'all getting quiet now. The worst form of racism in America today is hyper-Calvinism. Stay here. 
It's not God picked and choose, and God said, well, you know, I like this one, and I don't like that one, and this is a pretty good old boy, and that, well, he's not. <sighs> the gospel, how the Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. Matter of fact, I like to witness that way. I don't know about you. I, I, I like to walk up to somebody and say, I mean, don't know him from Adam's goat, amen, and say, Hey, listen, would you like some good news? Well, yeah, I guess so. It's been pretty bad today. Christ died for our sins. And they look at you like, okay, they let you out of the insane asylum this morning. Amen. I mean, why should I start with condemnation? Why don't I give them some good news first? Amen. That's the message of God's love. God loved you so much he gave you. So, do you understand what that means? That means that God preferred you over Jesus Christ. He let him go to the cross and it should have been us. Now look at this. Here's the result. He said that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, I do have a problem with theology. Here's what theology says. And the problem with theology is it tries to explain God in human terms, and you can't do that. I had a lady, and she was another denomination, and she said, uh, you know, said uh, I, I, I like going to Baptist churches. Said, I, There's just one thing I don't like about them. And I said, what's that? And she said, this thing of uh, once saved, always saved. And I said, well, number one, I don't believe that. She said, you don't? You're a Baptist? And I said, oh, no. I said, because it's become an excuse. Uh, now listen, we talk about the perseverance of the saints. Hmm. We talk about eternal security. Why do we call it what it is? It's everlasting life. Hello? That's what God said it was. <laughs> Amen? Now, now, now look, here's, here's John 3.15, John 3.16. Okay? One says eternal life, one says everlasting life. You go back and get your Greek New Testament, you know what? It's the same word. But in your King James Bible, it's not. Hello? So why did he change it? Because God gave him insight to the Word. Y'all getting quiet on me again. I need somebody that's real smart. No volunteer. Who? Who? In a... Oh, in a pink shirt. Oh, your brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You one of them sweet sisters, yeah. Oh, yeah. Your, your, your job growing up was to keep all them straight, wasn't it? Amen. Yeah, yeah, amen. <laughs> What's it? Is it John? Jordan. What's the difference between eternal life and everlasting life? Yeah, there is a difference. It's all right. They don't know either. <laughs> All right, let me explain it. You ready? No, he's still thinking. Okay. Okay. Now, don't dwell on this. Everlasting means from this point on. Never ends. I have life from the point of my salvation never ending wait a minute what's eternal now stay here this is my suppositional theology I think I can prove it by the book but you don't have time there was a I can't say a day in eternity there was I can't say a time in, there was a place in eternity 
where God stepped forward and set a parenthesis. The parenthesis is this. He called this time the first day of creation until Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6 where the angel stands and lifts his hand as a testimony to heaven and cries, there shall be no more time. And we live in that. I think we're getting way over here. All right? Time is in eternity. Wait a minute. We think in linear terms, and so what we understand is, okay, everlasting goes along by time until time ends and keeps going. But eternal... See, when you got saved, you became an eternal being. I'm telling you, don't dwell on this. It'll mess your mind up. I know from experience. Eternal is not just this way. It is this way, and this way, and this way, and that way, and that way. Don't dwell on it. <laughs> His mind's already messed up, I can tell. <laughs> now listen to me. When you got saved, you got everlasting life. It never ends, not in time or eternity in linear fashion. But wait a second. It means you become an eternal being because you're in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, you have eternal life. That never started and will never end and it's true this way and well we got a lot more than we ever thought of don't we amen <laughs> now let me tell you this is just me but I really feel sorry for lost folks because they had not got that <laughs> Woo! Now, why is it in verse 16 he talks about everlasting life and not eternal life? Because now we're going to deal with time. You ready? Here's the motive of God's love, verses 17 through 19. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth not, uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. <clears throat> What's the motive of, of God's love? Look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world. Mm. But that the world through him might be saved. You know why God sent his Son? So we could get saved. You, you, you see, if you're here tonight and you're lost, God's not standing over you with a stick just waiting to knock you into hell. He's drawing you. He's loving you. He so wants to see you saved. Mm. To understand this, you've got to understand that little word, condemn. The word condemn is a Greek word picture. Okay? Stay with me. Don't turn me off. I'm going to get technical on you. Okay? All right. Please don't turn me off. I'm going to get technical on you. Amen? All right. I got half of you anyway. Going to be late tonight, I'm telling you. A Greek word picture is this. We don't have it in English. But I can say a babbling brook and there's something that comes into your mind, a picture. Amen? Okay? 
That's the same thing. This word is a Greek word picture, and what happened was when you use a Greek word picture, everybody knew what it meant. And, and really, what it does, it just shortens it so that you, you can use it in a sentence, and everybody gets that whole big picture in one word. Okay? Amen. Now, I need to explain condemnation. Uh, Brother Bob... Uh, and Sister Sonny, can, can I use y'all in the illustration? Is that okay? Okay. All right. Stay with me. Let's say, are y'all good at supposing? Okay, good. Let's suppose... After the service, all the men are standing around over here. All the women have gone back over there, but all the men are standing around here. And Sister Sonny eases out the back door, walks back in, walks over here amongst the men, takes a pistol out of the folds of her, of her dress and goes, blam, 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 puts five right in Brother Bob's heart. Y'all with me? It's too late now. I, 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 I used this illustration one time. One, the, the lady said, A preacher, I didn't have to go out to the car. It's in my purse. Uh, oh, really? Oh, 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 she, she, she told on you. <laughs> brother, brother Bob falls down dead. Somebody grabs the pistol out of her hand. Somebody gets a hold of her, sets her down, steps behind the pew and holds her there. We call the sheriff. Christian shows up. He walks in. He looks at Brother Bob and Miss Sonny. He said, he said, and somebody says, I'm telling you, shot him five. Miss Sonny, what in the world did you do? Hmm. All the women are back there crying. All the men are saying, boy, she's a good shot. I mean, she put five right there. <laughs> so Christian puts the cuffs on her, takes her out, puts her in the cruiser. Comes back in and said, now, don't anybody leave. He said, I need all of your names. Why? Because all of us are witnesses. Except you, you're dead. <laughs> and he takes everybody's name one by one by one by one. Did you see this happen? Yeah, I mean, you couldn't miss it. I'm telling you. And phone number. And then he takes her to jail, and the preacher says, we need to pray. And we, say, we have a prayer meeting, amen. We don't know whether to pray for Bob. Well, no, it's too late to pray for Bob, amen. We pray for Sister Sonny. And they take you to jail, and the next morning you stand before the judge. And the judge says, uh, you've been charged with capital murder. See, she went out to the car and got the pistol and came back in. So it was premeditated. How do you plead? She says, not guilty, been wanting to do it a long time. <laughs> he sets a date for trial. And guess what? Everybody in this place gets to go to the trial. You know why? Oh, we're all witnesses. Well, she's sharp, I'm telling you. She done got it. We show up at the trial. They started, and one by one, they call a witness, and finally the judge said, all right, said, uh, the rest of you witnesses, uh, said, is this what you saw? Yeah. Said, Stand up. Yeah. yeah, that's what we saw, all of us. He said, okay, y'all dismissed. We got enough evidence right now. Her lawyer says, well, judge, I... I really don't have anybody I can call. I may, maybe a character witness or something, but after this, I don't think anybody would even 
be a witness for. The jury leaves. 20 minutes later, they come back in and say, guilty is charged. He sets a, the judge sets a date for sentencing. And on that date, says, you're, you're in trouble now. You do understand that. She stands before him, and some of us will be there, and he's, he'll say to her, you have been found guilty by a jury of your peers of capital murder in the death of Bob. I sentence you to be taken to Pee Wee Valley, there to be housed until the day you shall be lethally injected and your life shall be taken by the state of Kentucky. And may God have mercy on your soul. Why does he say that? Because I'm telling you, the state of Kentucky's finished with her. And they take you to Pee Wee Valley and they put you in a cell and that's your death cell. In that eight foot by ten foot cell, you will reside until the day you are lethally injected and your life is forfeited for the death of your husband. Now listen to me. That's what the Greek word picture means. The first time you sinned, the first time I sinned, we went on trial to God. We were found guilty. We were, sent, we were judged. We were sentenced. You say, well, what about the great white throne judgment? Oh, no, that's a judgment of works. You see, you're going to be called up out of hell, and at the great white throne judgment, it's a judgment of work. You're going to see how far down in the lake of fire you're going to be. But I'm telling you, it's already over. Now listen to me. If you're here and you're lost tonight, you're already in your death cell. You're just waiting for the axe to fall. You're just waiting to breathe your last breath. You say, well, well, Brother Bob, you know, said, uh, I got a lot of money, and, and, and I, I tell you, you know, I might be, uh, listen to me, you, you can have a, uh, gold on the floor and gold on the ceiling and silver on the walls and a 40 foot yacht and it doesn't matter I mean stacked up money everywhere but it's still a now y'all got to help me okay you ready it's still a death cell alright now the rest of you jump in here it's still a death cell you say preacher I'm as poor as Job's turkey and, and, and your death cell may have a dirt floor no paint on the walls no furniture but it's still a death cell. Preacher, I'm a party animal. Yeah, I don't mind going to hell. We're just going to party. We're going to party. Well, you just go ahead and have a party in your death cell, but the truth of the matter, it's still a death cell. Preacher, I'm politicians. I know people. I'm telling you, there's folks who get me out of this. Uh-huh. It's still a death cell. Preacher, I'm religious. I got a signed letter of commendation from the Pope. I got crosses and everything all over the walls. I mean, you know, I, I got a Bible and I read it every day. But folks, it's still a death cell. I want to tell you something. I wouldn't give you a used dip of snuff for any and all religion because all it does is send you to hell you see your circumstances have nothing to do with it at all it's your death cell and you're just waiting you're just waiting until the day you quit breathing your heart quits beating because you're already judged I was, I was witnessing to a fellow, he's a smart aleck. 
I recognize that because I've been a smart aleck all my life. He said, well, i tell you what, preacher. said, me and the man upstairs, we'll work it out when I get there. I really want to take 20 minutes and explain to him the doctrine of the man upstairs, but what I said to him was this. You do understand you're never going to see God. He said, what? I said, the Bible says in the 16th chapter of Luke, that the beggar died and was carried into Abraham's bosom, but the rich man died and boom! He was in the fire. I said, the only thing you're ever going to see of God once you die is the great white throne judgment when you stand before God and you're judged by the works you do. You're judged by what you did tonight to reject Jesus Christ to see how far down in the burning lake of fire you really going to be. See, the problem with a lost person is they're already condemned. It's already settled. And there is no hope aside from Jesus Christ. I'd say to you, if you lost, not run this altar. You may not make it home. Oh, preacher, you're trying to scare us. I wish I could. I could stand here for an hour and tell you about folks who rejected the gospel and said, no, God, and literally died and went to hell. Folks who rejected the gospel and God just cut them off. I asked the Lord the day after I got saved. I said, Lord... Show me what happened yesterday. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, that's the last time I was dealing with you. If you'd have rejected me yesterday, you'd have gone to hell. I was as finished with you as a doctor is with a dead man. Wow. Child of God. Why is it we waste all this time on the foolishness of this world when this world is already condemned and they're headed for hell and they have no hope unless they hear the gospel? When I was growing up, I was a drunk. I, matter of fact, when I got saved, I was a music and youth director in church and a drunk. Uh, I, I used to tell folks I was a social drunk and one of my preacher friend said no you're just a drunk and I said okay I was just a drunk by the time I was 17 years old uh, in Texas I could pass for 21 so I got me an ID but I was a smart drunk I figured out you know if I get caught driving daddy's car drunk then I'm not only going to have to spend a night in jail I'm going to have to face daddy. My daddy grew up in the oil fields in West Texas. He was about that tall. He was half Cherokee. And one of his best friends was John Barrow. Clyde Barrow. Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde Barrow's brother. You didn't mess with my daddy. <laughs> and a great soul winner. So I got real smart. What I'd do is I'd, I'd park two or three blocks away and I'd walk to the bar and do my drinking. Oh, I was an intelligent drunk. I was smarter than God. But I forgot that if you're drunk and you're walking on the street, you can't walk good. So you know what happens? That policeman's driving by. He stops, checks you out. You hide that ID, you better give him your 17-year-old idea. Amen. And you get to go to jail. Now, if you've been guilty of this, don't smile, don't act, so folks won't know, okay? And you get to spend the night in the drunk tank. The drunk tank is a glorious place. That's where they put all the drunks so they can sober them up. That means they're throwing up in the floor. There's one toilet, nothing around it. It's just open. And so they're all throwing up on a toilet, and you don't want to use that. They'll throw up on you. 
I remember a fellow one time was preaching from uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where he talked about be not drunk with wine. And he said, you know, it's a comparison, and we ought to be like a drunk. All this, you know, they're gregarious and happy. And I thought, man, you, did, you didn't drink with the drunks I drank with. They cut your throat in a second. But you got that whole bunch in there, and you're going to spend the night with them, and it's not going to be fun. Can I tell you the great thing about the drunk tank? Yeah, there's actually something good. Amen? Really? The next morning, that guard had walked down through there shaking his keys. And he'd say, Robert Martin? I'd say, yeah. He'd unlock that door. He'd say, you Robert Martin? I said, yeah. He'd say, you want out of here? I said, I'd love to get out of here. Come on. And he'd lock the door behind me. Best thing about the drunk tank. <laughs> Amen. Can I tell you something? January the 21st, 1971, the blessed Holy Ghost of God walked down in front of my death cell and he said, Robert Martin, will you trust Jesus? Will you turn from your sins? Will you give your heart and life to him? I said, I want to. Yes, amen. And he unlocked the door and I got out. <laughs> Woo! And listen, he locked the door behind me. I can't even get back in. Hallelujah. That's what the word condemnation means. What about you now? You saved? Were you like me? You just played the hypocrite for 27 years. And... Why don't you get up out of your seat and come get an altar? Trust Jesus. You're here tonight and you said, Preacher, I, I just didn't realize how much danger lost folks are in. And the problem is that I'm saved. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. But I've played the world's game and I've been diverted from what I'm supposed to be doing for God. And tonight, I want to repent and I want to settle my heart to see lost folks saved. Whatever it takes, tonight, from this point on, I'm going to be a witness. I'm going to be a prayer warrior. I'm going to love lost folks even when they don't love me. What about it? Our Father, help us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name. Would you stand, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Sis, if you come play something on the piano, if you need to get an altar, that won't Thanks to listeners people. like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, Preacher, what you want to do, just obey God. Just do what God tells you to do. Preacher, you, you, you don't realize what it's like in my family. You don't realize what it's like where I work. God does. And he sent you here tonight to face you with stark reality of what he wants you to do in this world that's wicked and ungodly and getting worse. Because if we don't do something, a whole bunch of folks are going to hell. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.